In this video, we're going to talk about the origins of spin-spin coupling in NMR spectra. So let's suppose we have this molecule here, and we want to take its NMR spectrum. So this would be a dichloro and dideuterated uh, ethane molecule. So these deuteriums are not NMR active. They do not have a half integer spin. They have a zero spin. So these two protons here each have a half integer nuclear spin, and they will appear on NMR at their resonance frequency. So this one is attached to two uh, very electronegative atoms next door to that carbon, so it's going to be much less shielded, so it'll be uh, a higher chemical shift. And this is marked on the spectrum by A. And uh, proton B here is further away from those electronegative groups, and so it doesn't feel that influence nearly as strongly, so it is, uh, it is much more upfield here and at a lower chemical shift for B. Now, normally, each of these two, if they were to not interact with each other, would each be their own separate system with a separate Hamiltonian, and they would uh, undergo resonance at a separate magnetic field and a separate resonance frequency, as we see on this type of spectrum here. But for those which are close enough to each other inside of a molecule, um, usually within three chemical bonds of each other, except for in special cases where they're within four chemical bonds of each other, and in those circumstances you can get what's called spin-spin coupling. So what I show here on this spectrum is instead of a single peak for A and a single peak for B, what you have is a doublet. And each of these is split by the same amount. They're split by the same frequency called the called a coupling frequency. And we want to know why this is. What in quantum mechanics tells us that if we have two protons nearby in a molecule which undergo nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, why is it that they will split each other into such uh, coupled peaks like that? So to answer this question, we're going to do first order perturbation theory. We're going to start with a zero order Hamiltonian, which is the individual Hamiltonian of each uh, distinguishable proton here. So the first Hamiltonian is minus gamma magnetic field 1 minus shielding constant times the uh, magnetic the magnetic operator in the z direction. So mag spin angular momentum in the z direction. Minus same thing for uh, nucleus 2 here, sigma 2. And uh, I believe as I've defined it here Let's see, which one of these is which? I have sigma 2 is greater than sigma 1 as I've drawn all these diagrams. So that means that the more shielded one is B, so B is 2 and A is 1. Okay, so <clears throat> this, is, this is B and this is A. All right, but the, the result of this coupling is that these individual... Uh, these individual nuclei here, they each have their own magnetic moment, and those magnetic moments are coupled to each other. They feel the magnetic field uh, created by each of the uh, other nuclei. And that coupling is usually proportional to, uh, for two magnetic dipoles, is proportional to the dot product of those two dipoles. So how much are they aligned or anti-aligned? And that'll be our... <clears throat> That'll be our perturbation, our H1 here, our perturbative Hamiltonian. And that's going to equal Planck's constant times J12, which is called the coupling constant, the coupling constant between nucleus 1 and nucleus 2. And that has a unit of hertz, as we've defined this Hamiltonian here. So H times J12 over H bar squared. And all of this is really just a constant. It's really just a proportionality constant. But we want to write this such that J has a unit of hertz for reasons that we'll see later. And then the rest of this operator is the uh, total spin angular momentum of nucleus 1 dotted with the spin angular momentum of nucleus 2. Notice this is the total angular momentum here, and these were each the z component. Because these are interacting with the default magnetic field of the spectrometer, which we've aligned in the z direction, and these are interacting with the magnetic field of each other, which could be in whatever direction we please, whatever direction the nuclei happen to have their magnetic moments pointed. So we can define a system here where we have four zero-order wave functions, psi 1, 2, 3, 4. These are where we have alpha, alpha, spin up, spin up, spin up, spin down, spin down, spin up, and finally beta, beta, spin down, spin down for nucleus 1 and nucleus 2 respectively. 
And we know how the IZ operator acts on alpha and beta, how the Z component of the nuclear spin angular momentum operator acts on them. It's plus one half H bar is the eigenvalue for alpha and minus one half H bar is the eigenvalue for beta. So you get a positive value for the spin up result and a negative value for spin down for the angular momentum in the Z direction. And this gives us a zero order energy. Our zero order energy is just H psi naught equals E naught psi naught, the Schrodinger equation for the reference system. And that's just minus uh, gamma beta, as we see uh, how we have a prefactor of both of those out there, times um, their, their Z component of the spin angular momentum quantum number, plus or minus one half, depending on whether it's alpha or beta m1 times 1 minus sigma 1 up here from this part plus m2 times 1 minus sigma 2 up from this part so it depends on their shielding and it depends on whether they are spin up or spin down what the energy levels are and those energy levels are diagrammed out over here on the left side and if you'll notice for these energy levels without any coupling in our reference system we have four distinct energy levels and there are four possible absorption frequencies here. But notice that if you look at the transition from state one to two, so flip one to two flipping uh, from alpha to beta on nucleus two, that's the same from one to two as it is from three to four, flipping from alpha to beta on nucleus two there, because it doesn't matter whether nucleus A is alpha or beta when they're not coupled, the frequency of absorption is gonna be the same. So that <clears throat> changing that frequency of nucleus 2 there, nucleus B, that gives rise to this first peak here, which was further upfield. And then we have the other case where we flip the nucleus, we flip the spin of nucleus 1 going from 1 to 3, alpha to beta, or going from 2 to 4, alpha to beta, and it didn't matter in that case whether it was alpha or beta for nucleus 2, we got the same frequency, and that just resulted in one peak over here. Okay, so now we want to couple them. <clears throat> so we want to calculate our first order correction to our energy. So for each of the given states here, 1, 2, 3, and 4, that's going to be the integral over both of their spins of psi star i, h1, psi i. That's the expression for the first order energy in first order perturbation theory. So now our h1, our h1 has this, uh, has this constant out in front, and then there's two operators dotted with one another. <clears throat> so we have I1 dot I2, and we know that that's equal to IX1 times IX2 plus IY1 times IY2 plus IZ1 times IZ2. It's just the sum of the product of each of the three Cartesian directions for those operators. Now if we start with Z, if we act IZ1, Z2 on a given wave function, psi i, what you'll get for your eigenvalue is m1, m2, h bar squared times psi i. Because our iz1 will act on alpha 1 or beta 1, and that'll give us plus or minus 1 half for m1 times h bar alpha or h bar beta. Then iz2 won't act on, it won't act on psi 1, it'll act on, it'll act on nucleus 2, and that'll either act on alpha or beta for nucleus 2, giving us plus or minus 1 half h bar for that as well. So this will be plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 1 half. That result will give us plus or minus 1 fourth. And then we have 1 h bar from the first operator, 1 h bar from the second, giving us h bar squared times psi i. So our eigenvalue for iz1, iz2 is going to be plus or minus 1 fourth h bar squared. Okay, so that's our operator acting on that, and so that gives us, if we look at the, just the z component of this first order energy, just this last term here, iz1, iz2, we're going to have our constant hj12 over h squared times the iz1, iz2 operator. This acts on psi i, and we get the eigenvalue of hj12 over h bar squared times m1, m2, h bar squared. Notice that we have an h bar squared on the top here. We have an h bar squared in our denominator and those two will cancel out. 
this m1, m2 is going to be plus or minus one fourth. So in the z direction, our first order energy is going to be hj12 over 4, and that's plus or minus. So plus or minus hj12 over 4. And for reasons that I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on, uh, the x and y components of these cases both end up being 0. So in the z case, these were these were eigenfunctions. Uh, all of our all of our wave functions here are, are eigenfunctions of the iz1 and iz2 operators. So what you got is psi star i psi i times a constant. So when we did that integral psi star i psi i, you just get one because these functions are orthonormal. So alpha one the integral of alpha star 1, alpha 1 is going to be 1. The integral of alpha star 1, beta 1 is going to be 0. They are orthonormal to each other. And when you operate with the ix and iy operators, you actually flip between alpha and beta. They aren't eigenfunctions, and so you end up getting an integral which is orthogonal, so you end up getting zeros for the ix and the iy components. So our whole first order energy comes from this z term here, and what we find is it depends on the product of m1 and m2 from the iz operator. So if they are if both of the spins are up or both of the spins are down, we're going to get plus hj12 over 4. And if they have different values, up down or down up, then you're going to get minus hj12 over 4. I have here for this plus or minus, it's plus if m1 and m2 are the same, it's minus if they're different. Now let's think about why that's the case. We're looking at the coupling between the magnetic moments of nucleus 1 and nucleus 2. So if they're both the same direction, um, that's going to couple negatively. That's going to, be a, it's going to be a positive energy because they don't want to be pointed in the same direction. So for alpha alpha and for beta beta, we get a positive, we get an increase in energy because they don't like being the same direction. Whereas for uh, down up and up down, they're in different directions, and so they like that. That's an energetic benefit, so the energy goes down. So it's minus if they have a different value for m1 and m2. So that's our coupling there, is the first order energy. So then our total energy is the zero order energy plus the first order energy. So we have that plotted over on the right here, and we see that's the change, that's the change going from the left to the right is the effect of our coupling. We notice that the outside states, this is up, up, this is down, down, those both go up in energy. They're penalized by the coupling because their spins are in the same direction. And we have these middle states here where we have uh, up, down, and down, up. And in both of those cases, the spins are opposite, so they gain some energy. They go down in energy. It's favorable. So we have the values there. What this results in is now. Um, this this frequency for the 1, 2, and the 3, 4 transition, so flipping the spin of, of nucleus 2 here, alpha to beta, alpha to beta, now it matters whether, whether nucleus 1 is alpha or beta, because in this first part here, now our, our energy ends up going, getting smaller, and, our, and our, it's different than the other transition here. So the transition when nucleus 1 is alpha is a s shorter distance energetically than when the transition is beta, when the other nucleus is beta. And similarly, when we want to flip the nucleus, we flip the spin of nucleus 1 going from alpha to beta or alpha to beta, it matters whether nucleus 2 is alpha or beta because those are coupling. So you see in the other case, both of these uh, frequencies get shifted there. And this is, this is highly exaggerated. Usually these values are much smaller uh, relative to the separation here, especially in the, in the approximation that first order perturbation theory is going to work. But this is kind of demonstrating the effect of how you have, now you have one transition which is lower in energy, one transition which is higher in energy, and what, you, what the result is, is now instead of being our default frequency of our spectrometer, our gamma magnetic field over 2 pi. Instead of being the default frequency of, of nu naught times 1 minus the shielding constant, now you get two different peaks of minus j12 over 2 and plus j12 over 2. 
So this is why we defined our coupling constant in this way, is because it changes the peaks to, to be shifted by plus or minus J12 over 2, and the distance between the two peaks which have been split is now J12. So the distance between the center of these peaks here is our new naught sigma 1 minus sigma 2. It's the frequency, it's the default frequency, so the frequency at which TMS absorbs times the difference in the shielding constants between these two nuclei. And then the diff and then those peaks, the center of them stays the same and they split out in either direction and they move plus or minus J12 over 2 and the separation between them is each J12. So the, the effect of the coupling is we get more peaks here and they separate from one another but we also can use that and it's helpful in identification because if this J12 is fairly unique then each of these two peaks are split by one another they're split by the same value so if this if our J12 here happens to be say 6 Hertz then this these two peaks will be 6 Hertz apart as will these so if we can tell that separately from all the other protons on the on the spectrum that's very helpful because we know that these two are coupled to one another so they have to be fairly close to one another inside the molecule um, this works formally for all kinds of all the protons in the in the molecule but J12 becomes very very small once these are separated by more than say three or four bonds so it would take a very 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 strong spectrometer to be able to resolve the coupling constant of protons which are separated by more than just a few chemical bonds from one another.